As pastors and ministry leaders, what do we do when we find ourselves in a season where we're out of rhythm or feeling like we're burning out? In this episode, I'm joined by Chip Ingram, CEO and teaching pastor of Living on the Edge. Chip's teachings are received by millions of people around the world through television, radio, and digital platforms. Chip has written over a dozen books and has served for four decades in ministry, pastoring churches ranging in size from a few dozen to several thousand. Chip shares with us from his own ministry experiences those times when he felt he was imbalanced, out of rhythm, and sort of burning out. Chip shares practices that he has incorporated into his life to help him draw in deeper connection with God and to create a healthy, sustainable rhythm for his ministry and his life. Are you ready? Let's go. Hello, friends, and welcome to another incredible episode of Front Stage Backstage. I'm your host, Jason Day, and it is my privilege each week to have the opportunity to sit down with a trusted ministry leader and have a conversation all in an effort to help you and pastors and ministry leaders just like you embrace a healthy, sustainable rhythm, both in life and in ministry. And we are proud to be a part of the Pastor Serve Network. And along with this episode, we actually create an entire toolkit that you can access at pastorserve.org slash network. In that toolkit, uh, there are lots of resources for you, including some key insights, and then a ministry leader's growth guide, which has questions for reflection that you and uh, the ministry leaders at your local church can work through to dig more deeply into today's conversation. Again, you can find that at pastorserve.org slash network. And if you're familiar with Pastor Serve, you know that we love pastors. We love uh, just coming alongside of and encouraging pastors. And we are offering a complimentary coaching session for any pastor or ministry leader. And you can find more information about that at pastorserve.org slash free session. Now, if you're joining us on YouTube, uh, thank you for, for being with us. Give us a thumbs up. And in the comments below, if you could just drop your name and the name of your church, uh, we would love to get to know you better. And our team will be praying for you and for your ministry. And whether you are joining us on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform, please be sure to subscribe or follow so you do not miss out on any of these great conversations. As I said, we have a great conversation for you today. And at this time, I would like to welcome Chip Ingram to Front Stage Backstage. Welcome, Chip. Jason, great to be with you. Thanks. Yeah, brother, thank you so much for making the time uh, to, to be with us. Now, Chip, you've been blessed to serve in ministry for a number of years, and you are, you are currently modeling a really healthy rhythm for life in ministry. Mm. Uh, many of us in ministry know the importance of, of a sustainable rhythm. Um, mm -hmm. Cognitively, we know the importance of caring for ourselves, yet, as we all know, the pressures, the expectations, unexpected issues arise um, all those things can kind of knock us out of, of that rhythm. Chip, I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit from, from your experience, um, maybe about any seasons of imbalance or times when, when you might were feeling a little burned out even, and how you might have navigated through those times and what God really has taught you through those. Sure. Well, I've had a number of those, and uh, I'm sure – what we're doing here is fellow strugglers. Um, you know, I think there's some things we really do need to do, but I think we just need to be honest to say one of the occupational hazards is stuff comes into your life and three people get cancer and two marriages go down and the world pandemic happens. And so I think we need to be realistic, but you also really have to realize an awful lot of that burnout happens because of internal things. And you have to put up some structures and barriers over time. So get back to your question. Um, you know, what, one thing you have to start doing is a, a little bit of research into your own sort of what made you the way you're wired. So I was probably a workaholic by the time I was 12 <laughs> and, um, you know, played two sports and was an RA and uh, was a small little point guard. You know, I guess I, I didn't realize I had my fellowship Christian athletes. Sure, I came to Christ through FCA uh, right after I graduated from high school. 
But I think the uh, after all of that, the very first church, it was about 35 people. It was in a rural area. And the, the pressure I put on myself of expectations. Um, so this isn't like you're overwhelmed. And, you know, like we grew to 50 people maybe in a year. And I was probably working 80 or 85 hours. Uh, when the phone rang, I jumped up and I got to meet this need. And I, you know, and it was a solo pastor, no help um, in terms of. And I ended up uh, going to the doctor, got really sick. And he goes, I can't find anything wrong except your immune system. You're, man, could you just tell me a little bit about your life? Mm. And he, he wasn't, a, wasn't necessarily a Christian. And I, he, my wife sat next to me because she was very concerned. I mean, the symptoms were kind of scary. And he goes, in as nice a way, you're really stupid. <laughs> you, know, you know, he goes, well, you, you know, and it's not like, you know, we think of that pastor of five or 10,000 or whatever. And, you know, I guess they're traveling the world and I can see, I mean, we got 50 people maybe. <laughs> and, and so what I learned out of that was I have limits that I am an overwhelming people pleaser, that I, um, I had deep, deep insecurities. And I really recognized those, those are the things that were driving my workaholism. And I really had to go into training, find my identity in Christ, all the things people know the right answers to. But that was um, the first time as a pastor, I had a similar experience when I, I was a teacher and a basketball coach. And as a lay person, led a college ministry, and all the I had the same symptoms. I, I was driving one day, and I couldn't move my neck either way. And I wow. woke up, and I woke up as though I'd been swimming with sweat, and it just my body had, was shutting down because it was you know till midnight, up at four a.m. Legalism, pray for an hour, then have your quiet time. <laughs> it, you know, it was just a warped view of God, a warped view of work, a warped view of ministry was there eight years and those, those elders and that, that little church grew and they taught me how to be a pastor. And I think the next major um, time was uh, I was in Santa Cruz. And for, for me, it was a really, really uh, sort of bizarre environment. So uh, they think Berkeley is like too far right. So very <laughs> first pride parade, multiple satanic bookstores. Um, and 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 yet, because of our brokenness, my wife and I from alcoholic families, just kind of being who we are, we have no explanation, Jason. Thousands of people showed up. Right. And um, I remember sitting in an elders meeting and, you know, we were doing five services with video overflow and portables. And and one of them said, we need to have a capital campaign. We need some room. And I remember thinking. I, I raised my hand. I said, what is a capital campaign? <laughs> I, I'd never heard, you know, I, I didn't right. know. And, uh, and every time, because God was moving, we, we would open a service. And within two or three weeks, that little place of, you know, 400, 450, it would just fill up again. And I felt like, well, if it had that, then I couldn't not stop that. And I uh, didn't have a very large staff. Maybe there was four of us. And I would share the gospel and like people would line up, you know, I was on heroin. I'm coming out of this lifestyle. Jesus is the answer. And I literally had got a stack of gospel of John's behind the pulpit. And after I'd given invitation, I would just read these and come back next week. Right. Right. <laughs> and, and so all the, uh, you know, we, all the, the pressures of growth, the pressures, you know, I had four kids, they were all growing up. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some things I think I did right during that time. Mm -hmm. um, because of our family background, uh, quick aside, uh, we ate together as a family. Um, I may have worked like crazy, but I was up at 4 a.m., but we ate dinner. And when I got home after dinner, I didn't, I didn't open my briefcase. I, I realized I, I need to be a dad. Right. And but what I my my fault was I always push my body a bit too far. But to, to press on to this, because this was a turning point in my whole life. Um, and by now, you know, I'm I'm a pretty disciplined person. So my time with God was I did not mess with that. A date with my wife, eating with my family, those things were in place. But the waves of 
it was just overwhelming. So I got in a season where I did two Saturday night services and three Sunday morning services, along with the staff that was growing and all the needs. And I did this for months. And I remember uh, after a couple months that after I got done on Sunday, um, I'd usually go get a good workout, play basketball with my kids and stuff and get sweaty. But I would be numb and not feel anything until Thursday. And I would start to unthaw. And then Friday was like an absolute. I did take a day, one day off. And, and then Saturday, you know, get up super early, play with the kids, two services. And um, I remember my wife, uh, it was a season where two or three very national people we really respected, loved, God used in our lives, fell morally. Mm. And my wife turned to me and she goes, you know, Chip, I, I you're a man. Maybe you can understand this. How can they love God, teach God's word and shipwreck? I, I, I'm, I'm, tr I'm sorry, honey. I can't get it. And, and I share that because um, this was the age where people were just learning to take study breaks. I'd never heard of one of those and famous pastors were taking study breaks. So I thought, I, man, I need one of those. So for the first time after like five years, I'd never been off more than about a week and a half, maybe a two week vacation was unheard of. And so I, I, two weeks of vacation and two weeks to study. And, uh, you know, we had great people come in, you know, who were filling in. And I, I went up to a cabin that, that a friend had. And I remember sitting out in one of those porches overlooking this lake near Tahoe. And I looked over at my wife and I realized this is after months of five services and all the rest. And it scared me to death because I didn't feel anything for her. Mm. And I didn't feel anything for God. Mm. And my, my emotions were just numb. And I, you know, I'm, I'm an old ex-athlete. And so it was like, you know, you know, I was a coach. You know, <laughs> I played basketball at college and overseas and, you know, just grind it out, you know. And right. I had grounded out to the point where I didn't feel anything. And I remember sitting, looking out over that lake and thinking, I know exactly why people that I really respect. I just want to feel something mm. and, and I, I just want some relief and, and I, and your thinking gets so weird. Like you're blaming God for blessing. You know, <laughs> you're not, right. Why did you bring all this on me? All, you know, and, and what I realized, um, I, I remember going to a little coffee shop and just telling the Lord, um, I don't need to feel you for you to be real. I think what's happened is I've burned my antenna. Mm. And, um, and so I, I need repaired. So I'm going to, I got up every morning in the Psalms. And if it said any place where it said his unfailing love, I would underline it. And I still remember it was like day 13. I had the first flicker of any emotional connection with the Lord again. And, um, and I remember that break and on, and then i i called a couple older pastors and said you know, I, I, this is new for me god's obviously blessing i i at least used to love what i get to do and they gave me some very wise counsel one older pastor said if you could tweak your way out of this chip you know you may not be the smartest guy in the world but you're not the dumbest you would have figured it out by now mm. it will require radical change you're, you're going to have to make dramatic steps. And uh, I remember going back to an elders meeting and saying, number one, I don't know anything about capital campaigns and I can't handle that with everything else. In fact, you know, maybe, maybe a little too vulnerable. I, I'll never forget. I was, I was, they asked me, how are you really doing? And I, I started to say, you know, fine, you're kind of okay. And I was so fragile no, no. And one, one of the elders said, no, no. I and mean, young guy, how are you really doing? I started bawling. I'm in an elders meeting. I'm thinking, oh my God, they're going <laughs> to fire me. You know, and these are great guys and we're great brothers. And I, I just, I just, something broke and they got around me and laid their hands on me and prayed for me. And it was so good because that young guy was a construction guy and goes, Hey guys, we're killing our pastor. I've done capital campaigns. Chip, I'll keep you informed. I'll own this. And then nice. it was, guys, uh, I can do three. All right. We, we can do 10. We can, we can do, you know, 10 weekend services if you want to. 
but my limit is three. And the other thing that happened was it was, okay, I got to stay refreshed. I need a break so often. I, I, our, our church, this is maybe may more than you want, but we had like Luis Palau. And now these are all non-believers. They're all first generation Christians. All these people who came, they never heard of Luis Palau. Right. So, I mean, I've got all these famous, great people. And the first week I'm gone, 500 less people. Next week, 800 less people, you know? And so after four weeks, I realized, wow, I'm feeling all this pressure, but this church has now created this unhealthy deal. And so I came back and, um, and again, it's a very non-religious. So, you know, I didn't have like someone looking over my shoulder and I got a stool out and it became what I called family time. And so, you know, we did the worship and all that. I said, you know, I'm going to teach here in just a minute. And I got a stool and I stuck it out. I said, we're going to have a little family time because at my house, when, you know, my kids start disobeying and I'm not that disciplined dad and all that, we all sit on the floor, get in a circle and say, okay, we got to, we got to realign. And I just said, I, you know, I love you, but I've never been more disappointed in you as a church ever. Mm. I, I, I'm gone for four weeks and you people only show up when I'm here. And I said, that puts me in a position where the only way is this. And it puts you in a position of depending on me. In fact, it was a church where I followed where two of the pastors fell in immorality and the thing blew apart. And, um, and so I said, here's what you need to understand. I met with the elders and um, we're going to go to a teaching team and I'm not going to advertise who's teaching. I guarantee I'll be morally responsible. You will hear God's word clearly, effectively, practically, theologically sound, and it's helpful. And we're committed to teaching God's word. But if it has to come through my personality and that's the only one you like, then you ought to pray about going to another church because mm. we're not doing that here. Right. That's good. And that, two things happen. One. I finally set some limits Two, I, I looking back, you know, uh, I was an old coach. So actually helping guys learn to preach was as much fun just about as preaching. And they all ended up becoming senior pastors eight years later. Right. Right. And, uh, and so the other was, it was like, okay, teach four or five, five part series and take a week or two off, get other people involved. And so that began a, a rhythm that was sustainable. And then every time I did something really new, I found that I would bust it too hard, have to learn. I, I didn't learn it as badly. Okay. Right. Right. But, uh, but there were certain things I put into my life um, that have allowed me to over, I guess this is my 40th year as a pastor um, in general, be pretty healthy and like my job and and I don't want I, this is not like one of those clichés but we just celebrated 44 years and we've had to work hard we've had to go to counseling from our family of origin alcoholic backgrounds and stuff but I I'm I'm more in love with my wife now than I've ever been she's more fun I've got four grown kids that again we all do the best we can you know right, right. If, if we're not going to take all the blame for when they don't walk with God. We certainly can't take the credit, but we can create an environment and say, Lord, we, oh, please, of all the things you could give me. And by God's grace, I have four kids that walk with God, married well, or raising their kids, um, overwhelmingly blessed. Um, and so not, not that everything has been easy, right. but uh, there's a handful of things we can talk about that I think. Yeah, yeah. You got to face as a pastor if you're going to be healthy. Yeah. And um, I would just say, here's the number one thing. By and large, the problem is not out there. Mm. By and large, the problem is here. Right. Um, you know, the, I used to say, and this is a bad metaphor, especially in our world today, but I, I'll use it reluctantly. When you feel such overwhelming pressure, I ask myself, who has the gun? that you're holding to your head and about 90% of it is you. Right. And there's other times where you're in a very unhealthy situation and you just got to ask yourself, wait a second. Uh, you got to lead with courage and one elder or two families can make your life miserable. And I've, I've seen pastors live under some level of pressure where you just need to look them in the eye and say, we're not going to do it that way. Yeah. 
you know, and I, I mean, you got to walk in integrity, get, get good counsel. I don't mean be harsh or autocratic, right, right. but I mean, I, I think there's, I, I remember another time when the, that early church went from about 35 people to about 450 in a town of about 2,500. Wow. And, and it was really exciting, but all along the way, this is why we want the church. And when we begin to invite uh, black and Hispanic and it was in the South and, oh man, I got all this pushback. And I remember being called into Dallas. Most of the leaders, you know, I thought they were rural people. Well, they lived in rural areas. One guy owned an insurance company, another guy two dealerships. And what I realized is very wealthy, powerful people moved outside of Dallas and they wanted a church like the really good churches there, which was fine. But in their mind, this it needs to work for us. And as we begin reaching the community that looked very much unlike them, right. both in ethnic and sociology, and this was in the early days because the, the, the elders over the time were great and godly men. But I remember being called down for a lunch. And, and, and you know, when you walk in a room and you realize a bunch of meetings happened before this one. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, it was like, you know, Chip, you know, we asked you to come here and the church is growing. We really appreciate that. And, but, um, you know, we, we've, we've talked and it's not that we are, you know, racist in any way or contrary to, you know, black or Hispanics, but, you know, in light of where our church is at and this and that, you know, we, we really think, you know, the direction you're taking us and some of the people that's, that's probably not going to be a good fit. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting again in that chair thinking, well, I think this might be one of those crossroads. Right. And, um, and I remember, you know, just going, okay, this is, this is how you get fired. And I thought, well, okay, I think that's a good one. Don't let money, you can't stay in a ministry because the pressure of money and I don't have another job, like, like the God that created the universe can't give you another job. He's looking for men and women to step up. And I remember sitting there fearful and saying, well, gentlemen, if you're asking me to help you create a church that works for you, where the Great Commission doesn't matter and we don't make disciples and Black and Hispanics and some of the kids I'm bringing to church. Now, did I push maybe a little too fast? I'll own that. But if you're asking me to change the focus of what Jesus called me to do and us to do as a church, then I'm guessing you probably maybe need to have another meeting where you decide, you know, you probably need a different pastor. And mm. you know what, and, and, you know, as fearful as that was, it was amazing. Bam. It wow. shut that, it shut that down and um, side sidebar. Uh, there was, uh, it, this was er, early on. And I remember praying very distinctly. Lord, move that guy out. Lord, move that guy out. Move that guy out. <laughs> and, you know, it took about three years. Uh, and and not, uh, not bad people, don't get me wrong. Right, right. But these were, these were leaders that their agenda was their picture of what the church ought to be that worked for them and their family and their preconceived ideas. Mm. And, you know, sometimes the greatest thing that can happen is people leave your church or they get off the leadership board. Right. And those, those are where I think pastors feel pressure. And um, so, God answered those prayers and yeah. the church ended up really, really flourishing and they taught me to be a pastor. So anyway, I think those, those are some of the things that, uh, now I could, I'd love to say those are all in the rear view mirror. Right. We just went through a big, big growth spurt of living on the edge and a bunch of stuff happening internationally. And I've been on the road internationally like crazy. And despite my, my youth and good looks, I'm really not... <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 68 and I feel like the demands are greater than ever before. And wow. I've done three international trips in the last, you know, like four months and, and loving it. But I find myself, un, you know, left to myself, my default. Right. And so I got to get pulled back and then we can talk about what kind of people and rhythms you need to have in your life. Yeah. So people can say to you, Hey, Ingram. Right. You're being stupid again. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Hey, Chip, whenever you um, – I'm, I'm curious. If you look back, whenever you took that time out and you went up to the cabin overlooking Lake Tahoe and, you know, you, you realized, you know, you, you unplugged enough to realize – I'm curious if – do you think you would have recognized that if you had not taken time out? 
I think I would have either, I would pray that I would have grounded out to the point that I would have had another physical crisis Mm. and ended up in the hospital instead of a moral or emotional or spiritual crisis, but no way. One of the things that, um, one of the rhythms that I developed was I do three, three messages. Now, and by the way, these are here, please hear, if you're mm-hmm. listening to us, this is not a prescription for you. Right. This was my prescription for me. This was my world, my personality, my, my life. What you, the point of this discussion is for those we're talking to, what do they need to do? Right. So, right. you know, okay. So for me, but for me, it was, um, I would never, I would never preach more than six weeks in a row. Mm-hmm. Because and you know because I always I was doing at least three services, um, and the other guys I wanted to, them to be in the rhythm. I I always planned three times a year to get away with my wife, even if it was only overnight, mm-hmm. and I make basically made it two out of three. Um, we we had I got rigorous about a day off on on Friday that at least I could get my head above water, and then during that really growing season after that, every six weeks maybe seven at the most. And it was only an all day and all night and all the next day. But I would take my Bible and we live near the mountains and either go to a monastery or in worst case scenario, a hotel where no one's at and just get uh, two full days and one night alone with my journal. And, 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 you know, it's like that passage, uh, you know, in Mark 1, where Jesus awakens a great while before dawn after his most busy day in ministry, and they come and they say to him, you know, hey, man, you got to get going. You're, you're a rock right. star. It's going great. <laughs> and, and I believe he went out to go back to the Father to say, I got to get realigned about why that I came. And then he uses that, you know, for our fellow pastors, you know, he uses that, that day of necessity. I must go to other places. And for me, it was processing sometimes i was so exhausted that when i when i landed there i'm not i don't take naps but i'd find myself fall asleep for an hour or two study the scriptures read take a walk but just completely decompress listen to the lord and then uh, I'm, I'm a verbal processor i don't think journals are for everybody but i lie to myself so one of the things i've been pretty consistent is i write i write things down and then when I feel pressure, I put a little box and I'll take the pressure and I'll turn it into a prayer request. And so th- when I would go, then I would look back over the last six weeks, you know, you know, you need to spend more time with Teresa. You need to spend a little more time with Teresa. You need to spend a little more time with Teresa. <laughs> so, you know, well, I've been writing that down for six or eight weeks, but I, you know, right. I think there's a message here. And uh, similarly, one of my patterns was at the near the end of the year is I actually would go back and I'd read through that the last year. And this is, here's where God's been at work. Right. And, and here's, and, and I don't want to be negative. Here's some things that he spoke to me. I, I took some steps. Right. You right. Know, yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm, you know, I'm making progress. Thank you, Lord. And here's some things that, you know, seem to be reoccurring that I, I need to pay attention to. And uh, so I, I developed, uh, this would be my daily rhythm. This would be my weekly rhythm. This is kind of what I did every month or six weeks. And then here, I, I actually got to where I didn't always get a month, but um, I would have a study break. I, I did take vacation. I got away. Um, we, five out of seven nights, it may sound crazy. We ate as a family. It's probably the most important discipleship that we did. Wow. And, and yes, I if you if you're picturing me, you know, as everyone's eating with open Bible. Okay, now my children, here's how it goes. Uh, I was much, it, we, yes, we were, we were in the scriptures, but it was much more um, conversation, praying, sharing. And then by the time they were 10, they were kind of learning to meet with God on their own. And so we did informal and formal times. But what I think it was an intentionality, right. what I realized was I, I can't let, youth sports ministry demands have us be some sort of a minivan family filled with activities that I'm going to look up and go. So, wow. Okay. You got to, 
He, there, thousands of dollars and hundreds of hours later, he got a lacrosse scholarship for fifteen hundred dollars a year. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, was that really about my son or daughter, or was that, you know? Yeah. So uh, I, I took us off the path, but. No, no, that's good. That's helpful. I love that because you shared, Chip, um, some of the practices, some of the rhythms that you've incorporated, you know, time away, uh, you know, date night with Teresa, spending time with the kids. What are some of the other practices that have served you well over the years? I think three three things I feel like uh, at the end of the day, what I realize is it's not just being moral or good or being on track. It's life. If I'm not if I'm not experiencing the life of Christ, I'm missing it. And so the little acronym that um, developed over time was bio for life. And so what I knew was I need to come before God daily. I need to do life. The I is for in community weekly, and the O is on mission 24/7. And so just just this sense that if Jesus couldn't do anything apart from the Father, Sometimes I feel like it. Sometimes I don't. You know, there's young pastors and older pastors. Um, what I realized was, for me, I'm going to get up early. Uh, I'm going to get a great cup of coffee. I'm going to go out and look at the stars and remember who I'm talking to. And then I'm going to spend time in God's Word every day and be as honest with Him and talk to Him. And um, and I'm going to then try and practice the presence of God. I'm going to uh, all throughout the day. Uh, I'm going to, I've got to have, whether it's two or three guys or whether it's a couple's Bible, depending on my season, I've got to have some people that they could give a rip what I do. They love me. I can share where I'm struggling with lust or finances or struggles or resentment, and I'm all in for them and they're all in for me. And it's not just during a crisis, but they're, 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 we're in this together. So when I make the phone call or when I, as one buddy, I, I get a text, it's 5, 15 a.m. Got to meet you at Pete's, man. Get down here and let's get a cup of coffee. I'm hurting, you know, and I, okay, right. you know, and the next week it might be 603. Hey, you know, I, uh, I just think you have to have that. And, and, and then the third is to be on mission, to realize when I wake up, I'm to be the servant leader in my home. When I drive out of my driveway, at least where I live, 9.7 people out of 10 don't know Jesus. Mm. And it's it's tragic, but I'm probably the only Christian they'll ever meet. So, you know, and then, so what are my gifts and how do I stay in them? So those are, that was um, the other, I think, really big thing that's helped me is, um, I think, being uh, being teachable so that always... I think it's easy. To, you get into this, you give out, you give out, you give out, you give out. Uh, I probably listen to books and listen to other people's sermons. And especially in my younger years, uh, when I was trying to figure out my own voice, it would be, I'd listen to this famous preacher. And so why is he so effective? And it might be, boy, he has passion. And this guy, he simplifies things. And, you know, it's Haddon Robinson. Those are the greatest introductions I've ever heard. Or <laughs> that guy, man alive, where does he get time to do that level of depth of study? But I was, you know, I, it was, right. I was, you know, I felt like I, I got to be learning and reading. And then in the early church, a guy named Bill that was an older guy that came alongside and uh, discipled me and mentored me. Then there was AC in Texas when I was 28, and we probably text. This is 40 years later. Mm. We text, call, connect every week. He's still my mentor. He's become like a dad to me. There's Dick that when I found myself in this church and exploding, and I don't know what I'm doing, and he ran a big company, and you know he had grown kids that were about my age, and my goal was to get my outline done by Thursday, you know, so I could have my Friday off. And if I got the basic outline done at 6 a.m., I could meet him at a little golf course. We could play nine holes. And the first three would debrief on life. The next three, I would I would give him my sermon, get what he thought. And the last three, you know, he'd make observations. We'd talk about leadership in the church. We'd eat breakfast together. And, you know, by 8 o'clock, I was back at, you know, but, but I mean, that was, you know, Dick's in my life. Right. Uh, today. Uh, so, you know, I think having, and, and that, 
the thing is it takes time and 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 the reason we get burned out is that we automatically think when we're not giving out or the expectations of people and you got to balance kind of balance that out and um and so i think a, a big one for me it was great because i loved it was uh, I played basketball in college and then coached. I mean, I'm a gym rat. I mean, if, if I, when I have the ball in the middle on the break and maybe with, where the chain link fence in the inner city or at some college because I keep my kept my bag with me all the time, I wasn't thinking about church. I got as sweaty as I could be. And I was in a world that there's a culture if you grow up like that. And no one knew I was a pastor. I did that a couple times a week. My wife would say, when you were younger, a couple times a week, you know? Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. And, and, but those also became my best buddies. And so I combined deep friendships with working out regularly. But it was just like, oh, oh, it just, you got to have something that's fun. And, yeah. and, and I'm not very good at that. Yeah, no, I, I think it's important ship to have that kind of release, right? That outlet yes. where you can, especially if it's, um, you know, for some people, it may be physical. For some people, it might be more creative, you know, maybe something in the arts, whatever it is, but some place where you can just kind of be, you know, you know, take off the, the hat of the pastor, yes, uh, you know, and just be yourself um, in, in that way. Chip, as we're, as we're kind of winding down, this has been f fantastic. Thank you for just opening your heart up and, and sharing. Um, you know, what God, how God has led you, you know, I appreciate your vulnerability. Um, that's helpful for all of us. But as we're winding this conversation down, I wanted to give you an opportunity, um, you know, brothers and sisters, mm. uh, pastors and ministry leaders watching along, just uh, words of encouragement, because the last few years have been challenging. Mm. Um, you know, culture, society is changing rapidly. Um, and, and just words of encouragement. Yeah. Here's what I'd say, first and foremost, is um, don't quit. It's really, really hard. Part of our American Christianity is the unconscious. If we do these things right and we're faithful to the Lord, then our circumstances in our life are going to turn out pretty well. And I always go back to those, you know, 11 of the 12 disciples. I kind of think they were in God's will and 11 of them get martyred and one ends up on a rock to write a book. And, and just to, to recognize, hang in there, be faithful. Um, refuse to let the mask versus no mask, the red state versus blue state, the vaccine versus non-vaccine, and, and make make Jesus bigger than all of that. And, and um, realize at the end of the day that uh, be faithful to the Lord. It's never, I don't think, been harder. But here's a word of encouragement. Um, I don't think in the last hundred years, we've had an opportunity to completely redo church. People aren't coming back. Some are. There's never been a time where you could stop and say, you know something? Um, what was it about how the way it used to be that really wasn't producing mature disciples that were reaching people? You know what? I'm not going to do that anymore. Right. I mean, there's never been a better time to make some radical changes. And I don't, and I don't mean this in a, in a bad way, and, but take this very carefully. There's some of you that have been in situations, the sideway energy, where you are, they don't want to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. They haven't been anywhere. They don't want to go anywhere. And at some point in time, you need to take some steps of courage to say, this is what we're going to do. And if you don't want to go to really make a difference, I totally understand. But my, my life stewardship is too important to spend my time fighting over non-essentials. And I know it's scary and risky, but start praying. If that's not the right place for you, where is the right place for you? And um, again, I'm not trying some mass exodus. You persevere, you hang in there. And I would just say too, I think the hardest thing for me has been uh, the courage to do what God wants me to do. Uh, I, it just, the fear of man is a snare. But blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. Yeah. And I go back to all the crossroads and, and and they never end. I mean, I'm in one right now thinking about, Lord, I think this is really what we're going to do. But oh, brother, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm scared. Right. I'm scared. Right. And uh, so I think leadership really is about courage and um, 
and, and some of you, as you hear me talk, you just, just pause. Um, David said, if your word had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. God really wants to help you, but maybe your antenna's built. Just blocking off some time and creating some structure where what goes into your mind and you know what you're eating and just 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 pause and kind of look at you you are and I am reaping sort of the mental, the physical diet um, that we put in. And it's been hard. And it's been so hard. I think some of us, at least I went through a season in the COVID where, you know, I didn't want to work out. I didn't feel like doing this. I gained about 10 pounds. I got discouraged. And I just, I just had to sort of like slam on the brakes and say, Ingram, you know something? Stop whining. Stop complaining. Stop focusing outwardly. Look up. Find a couple people that are willing to, you know, run in a positive way. And develop. Get, let's get back to some of those structures that bring health and life, and um, and just that you can't do that alone. You just right. you gotta, and you can't ask your husband if you're in staff, a staff member, or a pastor, or your wife to make that happen for you. We all have to say, I, I've got to, I've got to own that. Yeah. So. That's good, brother Chip. Love it. Thank you again for making time for us. Um, real quickly, as you're taking off, tell people about um, Living on the Edge, uh, you know, because you have so many resources. I mean, sure. unbelievable resources around the world, as you said. So so let us let them know uh, how they can uh, connect with those resources and what, what are some cool things you have going right now. You bet. I, uh, you know, those things, that bio, I, I tr we try and create resources to help people come before God. Uh, we have 25 kind of different kind of small groups, do life in community, uh, how to discover your gifts beyond mission. And then for those of you, your pastors, we kind of have resources to help the people in your church. So we teach the multitudes. We train small groups. We have tools for pastors and business leaders. And our goal is to help Christians live like Christians. And another way to say, make disciples who make disciples. So living on the edge, all one big word. Dot org. Living on the edge.org is the website. And probably the most exciting thing during COVID we did was uh, on, we have an app. It's just my name, Chip Ingram. And uh, I, I did these little uh, never talk more than eight or nine minutes. And then I gave people 10 minutes and I taught people how to hear God's voice and study the Bible for themselves. And it literally went viral with you know, a few hundred thousand people joining wow. me. But what was exciting was not, I didn't hear, oh, you're a wonderful teacher. It was, I didn't know I could understand the Bible for myself. And, and for those of you, I mean, it's, you know, it's like, you know, observation, interpretation, application. I mean, you yeah. know, it wasn't rocket science, <laughs> but I also just tried to make it real simple and help them learn to do it. And I said, if you'll stay with me for 15 days and you build this practice. And so that's. You know, when you want to disciple people to be able to say, this guy will meet with you personally. It's not teaching a group. I meet with one person, but obviously there's more than one person watching. Right, right. And, uh, so anyway, those are the, it's called Daily Discipleship with Chip. Uh, we did it as an experiment. And I think there's, and it's all core passages that Ephesians 4, Ephesians 1 to 3, Romans 12, James. Good. You know, all it's right. basic stuff. You want all the people in your church to start to grow on their own. So that's, that's awesome. living on the edge. Thanks, what, man. What a great resource, Chip. Thank you again for being here. And for those watching along, listening along, we'll have links to um, Living on the Edge and those resources Thanks. at pastorserve.org slash network. So be sure to check that out. Brother, I love you. I appreciate you. Thank you for Thank your you. heart for the church, for pastors, and most of all, your heart for Christ. It's so evident. Amen. All right. God bless you, my friend. Thank you, Jason. Now, before you go, I wanna remind you of an incredible free resource that our team puts together every single week to help you and your team dig more deeply and maximize the conversation that we just had. This is the weekly toolkit that we provide. And we understand that it's one thing to listen or watch uh, an episode, but it's something entirely different to actually take what you've heard, what you've watched, what you've seen and apply it to your life and to your ministry. 
You see, Front Stage Backstage is more than just a podcast or YouTube show about ministry leadership. We are a complete resource to help train you and your entire ministry team as you seek to grow and develop in life in ministry. Every single week, we provide a weekly toolkit, which has all types of tools in it to help you do just that. Now, you can find this at pastorserve.org slash network. That's pastorserve.org slash network. And there you'll find all of our shows, all of our episodes, and all of our weekly toolkits. Now, inside the toolkit are several tools, including video links and audio links for you to share with your team. There are resource links about different resources and tools that were mentioned in the conversation, several other tools. But the greatest thing is the Ministry Leaders Growth Guide. Our team pulls key insights and concepts from every conversation with our amazing guests. And then we also create engaging questions for you and your team to consider and process, providing space for you to reflect on how that episode's topic relates to your unique context at your local church, in your ministry, and in your life. Now you can use these questions in your regular staff meetings to guide your conversation as you invest in the growth of your ministry leaders. You can find the weekly toolkit at pastorserve.org slash network. We encourage you to check out that free resource. Until next time, I'm Jason Day, encouraging you to love well, live well, and lead well. God bless.